welcome to the Wednesday Morning Bible Study of the Shiloh Baptist Church of Plainfield, New Jersey. My name is Charlotte Banks, and I'm the facilitator for this Bible study and the book of Acts. And I'm so happy that you're studying with us today. Uh, Shiloh Baptist Church is located in the city of Plainfield. We have been there for 113 years serving that community and, and surrounding communities, not just Plainfield, but uh, this whole central New Jersey area. And now that we're streaming online, servicing much more. Praise God. So let's go to the Lord as we begin our Bible study today. Father God, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we come to you, Lord, so very grateful for yet another opportunity to come into your presence first and then to study your word. Lord, we're thankful that the word has been provided for us, that we can go to it at any point in time just to, to understand what it is that you're saying to us and to learn to apply it to our lives. So, Lord, now as we continue our study in the book of Acts, we're at the point, Lord, where we're seeing things come uh, pretty much to an end for that book. And we just want to understand, as it closes, how we should apply our lives to it. So thank you for it. We ask that the Holy Spirit prepare our hearts and our minds to bring to our remembrance what we've learned. And as we go forward in the study, we ask your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I am uh, excited, as always, and probably jumbled a little bit in, the, in my prayer, but God hears our prayers and he, he understands jumbled words and he understands moans and groans and so I'm thankful for that. So today we're going to be continuing uh, our look at Acts chapter 28 and we are in uh, verse 17, Acts chapter 28 verse 17. And I know um, I'm going to recap what, a little bit of what we did last week and, and go forward. And I think that some of you may have been uh, wondering, you know, well, why is she going back over some of this stuff? And um, I'll try to explain it as we go along, because we cannot really understand what's happening in this portion with Paul, uh, and, and starting with verse 17 and going forward, if we don't see and, and remind ourselves of what happened before. Okay, well, that was jumbled. Anyway, all right, I am going to pull myself together because I'll be all right. Thank you for hanging in there with me, and I'm going to just do a little reset and start again. Acts chapter 28, verse 17. We'll read the verse, and then I think my other comments will make sense, maybe for me. Let's see. I'm reading out of the NIV. Acts chapter 28, 17 says, Three days later he called together, the local Jewish leaders, when they had assembled, he said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. All right, well, that is just a jam-packed, filled uh, verse. So, as we know, he has settled in now. They've arrived in, uh, in Rome, and... Probably the other prisoners who were in the, the charge of the centurion are in the prison somewhere, some cell somewhere. But Paul is uh, allowed to have his own residence, and he's staying there. We, we spoke about things that we're, we were wondering, like how was it arranged and who might be paying for it and so forth. And we've, we just kind of put that to rest. And now we're looking at what is taking place. So last week we talked about the fact that uh, the first thing he does is to ask for these Jewish, local Jewish leaders to come, whereas we were thinking that he would want to see uh, the believers, because the believers made the trip, some of the believers made the trip to meet him on the journey from Putoli up to Rome. But that is not what he, he does. And so in this verse... He says to them, my brothers, and we spoke about this last week because he is creating a bond. He, he is bonding with the Jewish leaders to uh, let them know that he is still one of them, which of course he is. And we have seen this uh, with Paul, especially since he arrived in Jerusalem. We've seen him, I called it the shrewd Paul, adjust 
what he is going to say depending on the audience. And we spoke last week, we said that's not all that unusual because we, we do the same thing as well. But in this case, at this point here in chapter 28, not only does he adjust what he's saying to suit the audience, but he, um, I don't want to say alters, you know, because I, I spoke about that last week. We talked that we had to fact check the letter that the commander wrote and we had to fact check some things that Festus did. We're not fact checking Paul because we're not saying that he is lying, that they were just lying. But he is changing, in some cases, the order of events of things that took place, and he is omitting some. And I just found it quite curious as to why it was. And so that's what we're looking at. And that's the main reason that I'm going back. Number one, we, I want us to look at what actually took place and then try to understand why Paul is not saying some of the things that took place, why he is downplaying uh, some of them, um, and some reasons that I, I've come up with that I think um, might answer those questions. So when he, when he tells them in this verse, sorry, I guess I was talking too long, my screen went off. Um, when he says that, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. And the events that took place of him actually being arrested are all in Acts chapter 21. So that's where I want to go back to. We were over there last week, uh, spent some time there, and we'll spend a little bit more time there today because that's where it all started. So if you don't mind, go to Acts chapter 21. And let's start... Um, I think I want to start at verse 26. Yeah, last week we, we spent a little bit more time um, talking about when they actually arrived in Jerusalem and what how the elders greeted them and presented them with the um, this solution that they wanted Paul to uh, implement to a problem. We'll talk a little bit more about that problem in, in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 26, these are the particular events that lead up to the arrest because Paul has said to the Roman lead, the uh, sorry, the Jewish leaders in Rome that he was arrested and handed over to the Romans. And that, as we'll see here, as we looked last week and we're going to look again today, is not exactly what had happened. So I'm going to start here uh, with verse 26. It says, The next day Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Okay, that's just setting the scene. And you recall, you can just read earlier up in, in chapter 21 for the ad additional details. So verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia, and remember any time you see the province of Asia is primarily dealing with Ephesus. So some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in, at the temple, and they stirred up the whole crowd and seized them. So you recall when we were discussing that at first, Paul did nothing to start this, um, and that's going to become important in Acts chapter 28 and what he says to the uh, Roman Jewish leaders. He does not do anything to cause any problem. These uh, Jews from Ephesus just saw him. So Paul is in the temple taking care of what he needs to do for the purification rites. And they, I guess, are there, perhaps it was on pilgrimage or whatever, I don't know, but they saw him. And re you remember, it's been years since he was in Ephesus. So that's how long they were like harboring these feelings against him. So they saw him and, he, and initiated stuff. All right. So then at verse 28, it says, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. 
And I have to say again, as I've said before, the just how ridiculous that sounds. It's a group of them and one Paul, one man, Mr. Paul, and they're asking for help. All right, I digress. Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere. Exaggeration upon exaggeration, right? Against our people and our law and this place. That statement is going to come into effect in chapter 28. We're going to look at that. So keep that in mind. And he says, And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. So that sets up, um, they incense the crowd of anybody else who's there because it's such a, um, it was such a big deal for the Jews that in the portion of the temple that was for Jews only uh, and for men really because that was not even, women could not even come into this part. But the idea that there would be um, a non-Jew in it would get everyone else there if they even if they didn't know anything else that was going on but it would incense them and get them upset and that was so the Ephesian Jews did something that they knew was going to get um, other people involved and upset all right remember Paul did not do anything to start this okay we're going to skip down then to uh, verse 30 Sorry. My tablet wanted to go back to verse 28. I mean, chapter 28, like I, it heard me talking about it or something. So bear with me one second. All right. Skipping down to verse 30. At chapter 21, verse 30, says, The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. So we got a mob scene now. And you recall when we, when we first studied this, we talked about how in the Roman Empire, uh, rioting was illegal. And so the soldiers would do anything to prevent a riot because that was going to be a serious problem for them. <laughs> Excuse me. So the, it says, verse 30, the whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Verse 31. While they were trying to kill him. All right, this, this is crucial here, to kill him. Because only, um, in the Roman Empire, only Romans, Roman officials, military, whatever, could kill someone or do capital punishment. Uh, it anybody else any other territory that they had control over those local people they could not do that that was considered a capital uh, crime I'm sorry or a capital an action for a capital offense but they were trying to kill him which is what they really wanted to do they never wanted to hand him over to the Romans they just simply wanted to kill him okay while they were trying to kill him uh, this is still verse 31 News reached the commander of the Roman troops that, that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. So that was his first problem, that the whole city was in an uproar, and it was going to, it's happening on his watch. You know, so he, it was a real serious problem for him. Verse 32, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commanders and the, and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. We spoke about that last week. Uh, uh, as if they didn't want to be seen perpetrating the crime that they were actually perpetrating and trying to make Paul be the one. Okay. Verse 33, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. And at the time that we studied it, we spent a good amount of time uh, talking about the commander and how he took his action, like he acted first and asked questions later, and that just exacerbated the whole situation there. But this is the arrest. So in chapter 28, verse 17, Paul says that he was uh, arrested and handed over to the Romans. That's not the case. The people there, the Ephesian Jews and the rest of the crowd by this time, a mob scene, Really, he was rescued from the mob. So the commander, the Roman soldiers, came in 
and took him from it so that they would not kill him and arrested him but it really was more of taking him into protective custody is what we really really we could look at it so the question then is why would Paul why would he want to say or or why would he not say what the Jews had done that led up to or precipitated the arrest why is he giving them a pass so to speak why is he not uh, telling these Roman Jews what their colleagues in Jerusalem had done to him that led to the arrest well I thought about that for a while and and I think that and uh, this is just Charlotte thinking I think that he had seen in his time in Jerusalem and we're going to look at this uh, two instances of this how the Jews what would set them off like what would cause them to go fly off and and kind of go into these frenzies and I think that he did not want anything to happen uh, be, with the Jews in Rome before he could get uh, put his plan into action and I'm going to talk about what I think his plan is for the Jews in Rome as well so that's what came to my mind he had seen how uh, the reaction of the Jews in Jerusalem to certain things we're going to look at two particular instances um, and he wanted the Jews in Rome to know yes I, I was arrested because that's why I'm here now as a prisoner but I want you to know uh, that I was handed over to the Romans and he doesn't even go into any details um, some of us would have said well yes I was arrested but this is what led up to it and you know go into those details but that's not the the perspective that Paul has on the matter it's almost as if all of those details that he was beaten and, and everything else are not important to him that they just were kind of incidental and he now wants to talk to these uh, folks in Rome and he simply is saying I was arrested and I'm, I was in, put into Roman custody and that's how I am here how it is that I'm here today okay but for those of us who have studied this you know we need to I or I needed to have a better understanding of what took place and why it is that he might um, not be saying that to them okay so that's what led up to the arrest those are the events that led up to the arrest so he's now in Roman custody but it's the custody of the military uh, he's going to be turned over to the to the custody of the governor uh, which at the first was Felix and then of course Festus and that's really when he's in their custody because that's when we get into the trials all right so now back in Acts uh, 28 17 and you can do one of two things you can flip with me because we're going to be going back there and then back over here or you can stay at, at Acts chapter 21 uh, for a little while or both okay I'm going to just go back over to Acts chapter 28 17 just to read more because so far what I have talked about is the first part of what he says he says my brothers that's the bonding that's forming the relationship that's making us uh, making me part of uh, Paul is making himself part of them or making sure that they know yes I am still a Jew I am still an authentic Jew just like you are a Jew you are my brothers you know we have this common uh, heritage Moses the prophets and so forth I'm still there that's what he's saying the, the, there he that's what he's saying at first uh, then he goes on to say although I have done nothing against our people or against I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors okay that part of it deals with two things back in Acts chapter 28 I'm sorry back in Acts chapter 21 we saw um, when he 
when they, the entourage, the delegation, I should say, first came into town and they met with the elders in uh, James and the elders at the Church of Jerusalem, when they presented the offering, you recall that, uh, this is back up here in verse 17, they presented the offering, they were greeted, and after he gave his report, then James said to him, the problem that was happening with the new Jewish converts, so the church in Jerusalem had been winning over other Jewish, uh, other Jews to, to Christianity. And they wanted to say that to Paul, just like even though he was in uh, Gentile territory, and so he was winning more Gentiles to Christ. They wanted him to know that they are also doing well. They're winning more Jews to Christ, because that's what the population was in that area. But they presented him with a problem, because they were saying that the, the Jewish converts, this is here in this is still Acts chapter 21. This is but back up in verse 21 where it says, They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. So that is part of what Paul is saying in chapter 28 when he's saying that I have done nothing against our people or our customs or our ancestors because that came up there with the Jewish believers all right then we saw uh, just a few moments ago with the Ephesian Jews in chapter 28 we just looked at that I'm sorry not chapter 28 verse 28 of chapter 21 uh, where the Ephesian Jews says that he teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place so they add in this place which is the temple so Paul says to the Jews in Rome that he has done nothing none of these things because this Paul does not know what they may have heard and that's going to come out a little later in chapter 28 um, where he basically where it will show that he's concerned about what they may have heard and you know they respond back to him that they have not had any correspondence which and we'll talk about that when we get to that part but what is happening here that I think as the reason that why Paul changes the order of things and sort of downplays certain things and skips other other things when he's dealing with these folks in Rome is because he now um, is taking this meeting as the beginning of his evangelistic effort in Rome. Uh, so I think that he has changed what it was that he originally wanted to do in Rome because of, of his circumstances. So you recall, we looked at the scripture of Romans. Now you don't have to go there, but I'm going to go over there for just a moment and I'm going to read it to remind us of what was his original plan. In the letter uh, in Romans, which is just the very next book over after Acts, if you, and if you do want to turn with it, that's fine. It's Romans chapter 15. And I'm just going to read a couple verses. We read more of that uh, when we were looking at it. But I'm going to read verses 23 and 24. This is Paul writing to the believers in Rome, not the Jews, but to the believers. Um, verse 23 says, But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. So Paul's initial plans as far as Romans concern was that it would be part of another missionary journey and that he would visit Rome on his way to Spain and that he would spend time with the believers that's what he's saying there after I've enjoyed your company for a while he would spend some time with the believers 
and he's writing to them in advance. We know this was many years before it would have happened. It didn't happen um, because he's he's now in Roman jail. But he he was letting them know what it was he was planning to do and basically asking for their help as he continued on to Spain. So that was his original focus of what he wanted to do for Rome. All right, so now he is in Rome in Acts chapter 28, but he is a prisoner. And what, as I was thinking about this and considering it all, the he asked to see the Jewish leaders because now uh, Paul is not thinking, I don't even think he's thinking of his appeal. He is not doing any, any trial preparation. He is not... Um, making plans along those lines to, to meet Caesar, none of that. He is now saying, all right, I'm in Rome, so I'm going to continue my, uh, as if it were my missionary journey. It's just I can't go out. All right, so if he can't go out, who can come in? So you might recall, this is some time ago, um, Rome, the Roman Empire acknowledged certain religions of which the Jewish religion was one. And we spoke about this at the time with, of Emperor Claudius because at one point you recall he expelled the Jews from Rome because of everything that was going on, most of which involved um, a misunderstanding of who Jesus Christ was. And we dealt with that at the time. I think that was back maybe in Acts chapter 18 or so. Don't recall exactly. But anyway, the, the Jewish religion, uh, when Rome, and it might have been when they, they made their way over to Judea, I don't exactly know when, but they accepted that uh, and as one of the acknowledged religions. Because now, if you were not a religion that the Roman Empire acknowledged, you were not allowed to practice your worship. It was, it was illegal. So that was an important thing. And one of the things that the Jews pressed frequently was that the Christians, this new way, as they called it at that time, was not an approved Roman Empire religion. So keeping that in, in, in the back of your mind, I know I went through that kind of quickly, but that was the nature of things. So Paul now is in Rome. He is simply just... Uh, reorganize his thoughts and his plans and says, all right, I've got to continue this missionary journey. It's just I won't be going anywhere else. But I can still proclaim Christ and I can still teach the gospel and I can still explain how it is that Christ is in fact the Messiah because the Jews can come in. So the Jews would be free to come and go whereas it is less likely that the believers would be able to come in. Okay, so now this is Charlotte. This is not anything that I read anywhere. No other commentator said it, no research that I've done, but it's what makes sense in my mind that Paul now uh, is continuing or changing his plans for what he was going to do when he got to Rome. He had written to them, we just read that in the book of Romans, of what it was that he was planning to do, come to Rome, continue on to Spain, and so forth. But that's not going to happen. So he will not be deterred from spreading the gospel. It's, it's ingrained, it's like in his bones, something he has to do. So he now will go back to the first thing that he would always do, and that would be to talk to the Jews. So... I think that because they had the ability or the freedom to come and go, he could invite them in, uh, whereas he would not be able to have that kind of freedom to have the believers. Uh, I'm sorry, not he had freedom, but the believers probably didn't have that kind of freedom to come and go, say, to a visit a person who was uh, in Roman custody. Okay, so th those are my thoughts on that one. So I think that now his focus, and we're going to see more of this. You'll see it a little bit later in chapter 28 of how it is that I came to this conclusion of what it is that Paul is now uh, trying to do, his focus. Okay, so he calls uh, 
the Jewish leaders together. All right, so I'm going back now to Acts chapter 28, verse 17. Okay, so he says to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, we just talked about that, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. So that's that's what he he says to them. And you know, we just looked at how that is, it is not exactly how it happened. But I wanted to go over a couple more things on that. We saw that we we looked briefly at what the Jewish believers in Rome, the rumors that they were hearing, and how Paul is, is sort of addressing that in this general comment to the, the Jewish leaders in Rome. And we saw how the Ephesian Jews, and he, Paul takes into their accusations. And even though the Jewish leaders in Rome don't know any of this background, Paul covers that. So this is part of, of him pulling out certain of the things that happened and presenting them while not presenting others. All right. So I want to then continue on looking more into him being taken into the Roman custody after the arrest, just, just as a refresher for us. So let's go back over to Acts chapter 21. And I want to look at Okay, verse 33 again. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. So verse 34. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander couldn't get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. And you know, they, that was the Roman military barracks. The Antonia Fortress was right next to the temple and in fact uh, from the fortress they could look down into the temple courtyards and so forth and that that was a whole um, separate problem for the Jews and the Romans one part when they had the, the different wars that the Jews had against the Romans that was part of one issue was how much of the temple the Romans could see from their fortress okay that's that's an aside and uh, I'll rein myself back in. See, that's why I get excited. There are just so many, so many details, so many tangents, so many facets, maybe I should put it that way, of all of this, um, that it's hard to look at just one part of it. Okay, so now that he is in the hands of the Romans, because the, the commander now is physically removing him from the temple completely to take him over to the Roman barracks to try to get more answers and to, uh, like, say, for instance, a, a further interrogation. And uh, this is going to lead up to him being sent to Caesarea, which is really then when he's in the hands of the Romans, because once he's in Caesarea, that's when the, the trials start. So I want you just, I want you to, to bear with me because I think that this is important for us just to hear it again. I'm just going to be reading some of this text um, in these next couple chapters just so that we can sort of get into our mind the things that have happened, all of the things that have happened, and that will make it even, make the, make it will, all right, let me start again. All of the things that have happened leading up to um, the trials make it much stand out so much more by Paul not saying them in Rome. Sorry, so I'm, that's a little convoluted. So Paul eliminates details that really are pertinent and important, but they they show us his uh, frame of mind. They appear these details 
are appear pertinent and important to us and they happen to Paul but we are beginning to see and we gain light on the fact that they don't seem to have they don't seem to matter to him as far as what it is that he wants to do in presenting the word of God okay so I'm just going to uh, to read through them starting in Acts chapter 22 because he asks at the end of chapter 21 he asks the commander for permission to address the crowd now this is the crowd keep in mind part of the ones that just beat him part of the ones that were part participating in this riot that's going on in the city as they're all trying to run down there to get to the temple to see what's going on and this man is being beat and all this stuff these things that they're hearing the mob mentality and you recall that the Romans had to actually the soldiers had to physically carry Paul over because of the crowd so let me let me just read that again to you because you, you need to to see this and in chapter 21 verse starting with verse 34 some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar he ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks when Paul reached the steps the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers so they're trying to walk, and that's not a big, huge distance. So they're trying to, to walk him around. He, remember, he's chained now to two soldiers. They're trying to walk him around to the fortress so that they can get to the truth of the matter since they can't get any answers out of the crowd. Somebody's saying this and somebody's saying the others. But the crowd, as they're seeing him, it's, it's almost like, no, they're taking him away. We want to kill him. Don't let him take him away and he'll be safe. So they are trying to, like, grab him. The, the scripture says here, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. So the soldiers had to, like, pick him up and carry him because the people were probably trying to grab his legs and arms and tear him limb from limb. So they really were saving or rescuing Paul the Romans yes he was arrested but it was not it was not the mild scene that Paul told the, the Jews in in Rome where he says I was uh, handed arrested and handed over to the Romans not that simple okay but even though he was close to losing his life that didn't matter to him he wants to present something to them and he just wants them to have a general understanding of why he's a prisoner there in Rome at that time. Okay, so he is, Paul asked the commander to, that, can he address this crowd? I wouldn't want to talk to that crowd after what had just happened to me. But then, you know, I'm not Paul. Paul wants even though he sees that this is a mob scene and that they're out of control he wants to address them I guess in his heart he thinks that if I can explain to them if I can use a little logic and just explain what has happened they'll be they'll be all right I don't know but let's see what happens here this is Acts chapter 22 he says brothers and fathers and we and we spoke about this before because that he calls the Jews in Rome brothers so he bonds with them because he is a Jew. And in the crowd here in Jerusalem, he knows that there are some of the Jewish elders there. That's why he says fathers. But he says, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard them, him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And I am going to work real hard to restrain myself from going over these points because we went over in detail. But if I get off and have to go into detail, bear with me. You know how I am. All right, then verse 3. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Verse 4. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death death 
arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Verse 6. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Verse 9. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Verse 12. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 19. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you to the Gentiles. This is where I was wanting to get to for you to see. Verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. Some of the translations say kill him. So this set them off when Paul said go I will send you far away to the Gentiles it sent the crowd into another frenzy so they had quieted down and they were listening to him when he says this when he says that Jesus told him I will send you to the Gentiles they just erupt so that is one of the things that I think Paul did not want to have happen with the Jews in Rome until he was able to share the message he wanted to share with them. He had seen how here on the steps of the Antonia Fortress that the crowd was set into an uproar over this statement. Okay, so that's why I, I went through this again. And, and there's another time that the uh, the crowd gets or the Jews get set off and we'll look at that too because I think this in my mind filters into uh, or this plays a part in how he filtered out what he told the Jews in Rome of all the things that happened to them I think that th this is the shrewd Paul I think he wanted to be able to control the reaction in order to say all that he needed to say See, that, that's what was happening here. He wanted to say these things. He wanted to explain this. But he gets to a certain point and he gets stopped because the people cannot deal with what it is that he has just said. You know, they close their ears and, and, and from that point. Okay. Now, the other portion of it... Um, I'm going to skip part of this because uh, the remainder of chapter 22 deals with the uh, the commander taking him in about the flogging and, and 
learning that he's a Roman citizen, which at that point changes everything from the commander's perspective because he is in deep trouble uh, for what he has done to a Roman citizen. So his whole perspective on the matter changes. He still doesn't know what happened, though. And that is really bothering him because he's going to have to write up his report about why there was this riot in Jerusalem. And oh my goodness, that's on his watch. Now he's got this little, I think, probably a very nice little cushy job. He's there in one place. He's not out in any desert or any place. He's got a nice little fortress in there. And he just has to watch the temple and control the town. So this is in my mind. So I'm thinking this is like a great job. You know, think of some of the other uh, Roman commanders of what they had to put up with. So this commander, Lysias, really wants to kind of keep things quiet. And, and we'll see by his actions uh, how that is the case. All right, so now in chapter 22, verse 30, it says, The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day, he released them and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. All right, let's go over to chapter 23. So now we, we dealt with that at length, that whole thing. But it's important that we see what happened in the Sanhedrin because this is the other incident that set the Jews off uh, that I think is why Paul does not mention it when he's dealing with the Romans. Okay, verse chapter 23, verse 1. And I am really going to work hard to control myself on this one because you know that whole scene in the Sanhedrin. Well, let me just go through it and work hard, okay? Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. This was the first time that we saw this side of Paul. We're all reading this like, oh, what did he say? Because it was so out of character for him. And he kind of pulls himself back, but then it, it happens yet again. All right, verse 4. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, and I think this was sarcasm here, but Paul replied in verse 5, Brothers, I did not realize he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, verse 6, Knowing, that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. All right. So now this was deliberate. You saw this because it said knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees. So the first thing that we saw at this when he was in the Sanhedrin and I think it's this is a group, a body of Jews about to judge him. When he was on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, he was trying to appeal to the crowd in general, not just the Jews in charge, but that could be some lay people or, or whatever. He was trying to appeal for reason. When he saw that that wasn't going to work because they couldn't deal with the fact that, he, that Jesus told him he was going to be sent to the Gentiles, he tries a different approach. But he goes in and he simply makes a statement of what he has done in his life and, and he gets slapped. And I think that was like, all right, you know what? It's on now. So he takes a different approach then. And he says, this makes a statement in verse 6. My brothers, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Verse 9. 
There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or angel has spoken to him? The dispute, this is in the Sanhedrin, folks. The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. All this violence. The commander again has to rescue him from being torn limb from limb. All right, verse 10. The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Okay. So what Paul sees here is that the mention, just the mention of the hope of the resurrection set off this crowd but only a portion of them and part of this was deliberate this I think the Paul deliberately divided these Jews the Sadducees and the Pharisees so the sad the Sadducees don't believe in any resurrection but the Pharisees do so now the Pharisees have a dilemma because how can they be be against this man have him on trial or or an inquiry because the Jews really couldn't hold a trial but have him in for this inquiry if he believed what they believed so they then have to pit themselves against their colleagues the Sadducees in the Sanhedrin okay so that was the second thing that happened so at the mention number one at the mention of being sent to the Gentiles that crowd this is back over at the steps of the Antonia Fortrum. They went crazy with that. And then here in the Sanhedrin, at the mention of the resurrection, they get divided. And and they they don't just disagree. You see it. I mean, they, they, they disagree with violence. They probably were coming up out of their chairs and reaching across the aisle and all mayhem. Because it says right there in the scriptures, the commander thought was afraid Paul would be torn piece from torn to pieces. All right, reining myself back in, reining myself. Okay, so when I thought about these two particular incidents, and we're going to see some more stuff, but these two in particular, I said, okay, Paul does not want to go into detail of the different things that happened to him on his way to, to where the Romans where the Roman Jews find him there in Rome in, in, in custody he doesn't want to mention all the things that happened because he does not want anything to detract or to take their attention away from what it is he is about to say to them alright so so that's my take on it. I, I think that that was why. Because it really was bothering me that he was filtering so much. Now, we saw when, uh, when I started calling him the shrewd Paul, we saw that he was dealing with things um, like w when the commander asked him if he was uh, who he was, he simply said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus. But when he gets on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, he goes into more detail. I was brought up here under Gamaliel and so forth. So he targeted the audience. I called that the shrewd Paul. But when he is in Rome, he he is changing some things. As I said, we're we're not. It's not a fact check. It's not that he's lying or whatever. But he is downplaying some things that were really crucial in getting him to where it is that he was there. Okay. Now the. He, he gets transferred up to Caesarea where, where the trials actually begin. Um, okay, I'm going to skip part of this. You, you can tell how hard it is to me, but I'm going to skip part of this um, to, to get down uh, to the letter that the commander Claudius Lysias sends. Claudius Lysias is going to send Paul up to Caesarea. He has made the determination uh, that he has to get him out of there because you know he got wind of the plot to kill him. And so verse 26, this is Acts chapter 23, 
verse 26. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. Okay, we, we already did the fact check, so I'm not going to talk about that. Verse 28, I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So, you know, we went through that whole letter, the things that were true and not true. But the, the bottom line is, is that this is the first that we're seeing from the Roman perspective that they can't quite figure out what it is that Paul has done. Now, we're going to come shortly uh, with Festus, who basically agrees that Paul is innocent. Uh, the commander here is not saying that he's innocent, but he's simply saying, I don't, I can't see it. You know, I, I can't see why it is that, that he, you know, he should be, uh, you know, that he deserved death or imprisonment because only the Romans could, could uh, impose that. So uh, that's it, where we are. I do have to stop. I know we're just about out of time. And uh, I'm going to stop right there and not say any more. Uh, yeah, I really have to stop. Okay. Thank you for bearing with me today for being in this uh, time as we look to what happened as compared to what Paul is saying because it is, it is going to be important. But uh, we do live stream this Bible study on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. and we also live stream our worship services on Sunday at 9 a.m. So we invite you to join us in live stream or at watch at any point in time that you want. It's available wherever you uh, watch it. Our Sunday worship services, though, we invite you to join us in person. On our website, shilohplainfield.org, there is a link that you can sign up for in-person worship. Now, this Sunday coming, October 3rd, is the first Sunday in October. And it is just an in incredibly important and, and historic and monumental day in the life of Shiloh Baptist Church. Because this is the day that our pastor-elect, the Reverend Dr. Daniel L. Brown, will begin her tenure as the senior pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church. So we are just so excited. And we would really just uh, uh, love to have you come join us in person on Sunday for this historic event. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we will commemorate the Lord's Supper. We always do that at Shiloh on the first Sunday. If you are not able to join us in person, please, by all means, join us on our live stream and have your elements available for, for consecration. So your elements for the Lord's Supper would be some bread or cracker or uh, and some juice. Wine if you wanted to. It is in the morning, but those are the elements of, of communion, the body and blood. So we will consecrate those elements as we do during the worship service, and we would like to consecrate your elements as well, so if you can have those available. Uh, I'm just going to quickly remind you of, to register to vote. If you're not registered, encourage others to register if they're not. The deadline in New Jersey for voter registration is October 12th. Um, because even though this is not, like, say, a, a really big national election, it matters. Every election matters. As a matter of fact, your local elections affect your personal life even more. So um, plan to vote uh, and get, make sure you're registered to vote. Uh, get your proof of your COVID vaccination, uh, your docket app. There's information on our website about that. And we want to just uh, go and close in prayer, uh, asking that you keep in your prayers our pastor, uh, Reverend Dr. Daniel L. Brown, in your prayers, as well as the Shiloh leadership and all the members of the Shiloh Baptist Church, because we are in a new journey where it's a new beginning and we're so excited. So we ask that you keep that in your prayers, that the Lord will continue to bless us. 
He's kept us there for 113 years for his glory. And we want that to continue going forward. Keep also in prayer all the sick and shut in, um, all of those that are uh, suffering or still dealing with all this COVID, the, the back to school initiative and all the things that are happening there. Just keep it in your prayers. Put it in God's hands. Those are the best hands. And now let's go go with me now to uh, to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord, we reign in our hearts and our minds. But Lord, we know you, you don't mind our excitement. We're excited about Jesus. That's a good thing. So Lord, we just ask that you be with us, guide us, and keep us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for all that we've learned. And we ask uh, for the week coming up, and especially for this Sunday, such as an historic day, that all that we do will give you the glory. That's what we want. And we ask this prayer right now in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen.